topic of uh, uh, soil acidity uh, clearly uh, is an important important issue for us. And uh, for me, this this goes back to um, about 1981. At least uh, Bob Mahler at the University of Idaho was the first one that I remember um, sharing uh, or publishing a paper talking about um, soil acidity. And he basically had done a survey of soil test lab results over over about a 40 year period for Eastern Washington and North Idaho and and showed clearly in that data that our that our pHs were declining. Um, that uh, uh, was um, in conjunction with some other research that's, that was going on at the time uh, by my predecessor, Bill Briel, looking at the effect of, of soil acidity on some plant diseases. And, and we know from uh, the presentations here that, that as the soil pH declines, we, we get reduced plant vigor and yields due to both nutrient deficiencies and toxicities, as well as uh, it can be due to increased disease. Um, here's an example of aluminum toxicity. Uh, this is work that was done in, in Australia. And what they had were two varieties that, that uh, one was tolerant and one was sensitive to aluminum. And they grew these uh, varieties in um, liquid culture. And the photo there on the left shows the T is for tolerant and S is for sensitive. These are four day old wheat root tips grown in a solution of five micromolar uh, aluminum chloride. And if you look in the photo on the upper right, um, that shows uh, root tips that were stained with a, a material hematoxylin that shows where aluminum accumulates. And in the top two roots, tolerant and susceptible without aluminum, and then below that tolerant and susceptible with aluminum. And you can see very clearly in that where there's no aluminum present, there's no red staining indicating uh, presence of aluminum. And in the sensitive variety on the bottom where aluminum was present, you can see uh, accumulation of aluminum. So the aluminum has direct effects um, on the root. But some diseases also have uh, impact on, on crop productivity as pH changes. And this is a list of, of some of the common diseases in, um, in Eastern Washington and North Idaho. And on the left-hand column there, I, I have under pH, a question mark for things like stripe rust, the snow molds and soil-borne wheat mosaic, where we really don't have any information. Uh, things like uh, eye spot, I have a plus and minus, Rhizoctonia root rot, fusarium foot rot. We have some data indicating uh, an effect of pH. And then for some other diseases like cephalosporium stripe, pythium, uh, seed and root rot, and take all, uh, where we have the plus indicated, uh, we know we have very good data on the effect of pH. And in the case of cephalosporium stripe, as pH decreases or soil becomes more acid, the disease becomes more severe. For take all, it's just the opposite. As pH increases above um, uh, neutrality, uh, the disease becomes more severe. With pythium seed rot, um, the, de the data uh, are more weak in terms of the impact of the disease as soil pH declines, but there is a trend there. But for cephalosporium stripe, um, this, is a, this is a vascular wilt disease, and it's very common for other vascular wilt diseases, things like the fusarium wilts, to become more severe as uh, soil becomes more acid. This is an example of the, of the symptoms of cephalosporium stripe. And this, this uh, illustration here really is the one that, that, that says it all. This is work that was done by a graduate student back in the early 1980s, uh, looking at the effect of soil pH on cephalosporium stripe. And this uh, study was conducted in some microplots uh, near, the, near our greenhouses. And essentially what they did was to collect field soil and then adjust the pH either down or up. And these are the two extremes. So uh, pH 4.5 and pH 7.5, they grew a susceptible variety in these soils, and then they inoculated half of the rows with um, the cephalosporium stripe pathogen. And you can see on the left in pH 4.5 that um, the inoculated plants are severely stunted, which is typical of, of severe cephalosporium stripe. Um, and the check plants on the left, the uninoculated plants, uh, appear to be healthy. 
in contrast, when you look at pH 7.5, um, you really can't distinguish which rows were inoculated and which were um, um, not inoculated. And, and this was the result that really stimulated um, our work on uh, soil acidity and cephalosporin stripe. And we, we began working on this about 1985. And in 1992, we published a paper demonstrating that liming was effective in controlling um, uh, cephalosporium stripe. Well, fast forward, we're 40 years down the road now, and um, uh, things haven't changed very much in terms of how much lime is going on in the um, Pacific Northwest, and so especially the inland Northwest. So we decided uh, several years ago to take a look at some alternative um, um, soil amendments that might have an effect on, on um, soil acidity, in particular, uh, fly ash. Um, we were introduced to um, uh, the folks at Inland Empire Paper Company, and at the time, they were producing about 25 tons of fly ash a day with no use for the material. On the left uh, is a product that we had used in the past. This is a prilled form of, of limestone. It's a calcium carbonate uh, limestone, but there are, are other forms of lime like dolomite, which is a calcium magnesium carbonate. Um, the problem in the Northwest is that there's a limited supply locally and um, it's expensive. It's expensive to purchase and it's expensive to haul and apply. The cow prill was a prilled form that we could apply with um, conventional uh, spreader um, equipment and uh, made, made it easy. Fly ash, on the other hand, you can see on the right hand side is, uh, is a material that's very much like lime. Uh, it's powdery. Uh, it is a byproduct of paper production. It's about 60% uh, calcium oxide and has a lime value of around 100. And so it's similar to a uh, builder's lime. And, and like I mentioned a minute ago, at the time there was no current use. Uh, and so it was available uh, for a low cost. The other product that we were interested in looking at was biochar. And um, uh, biochar essentially is uh, plant material uh, or animal manure that has been subject, subjected to uh, pyrolysis, basically exposed to a uh, very high temperature in the absence of oxygen. It resembles charcoal uh, in, an appear in appearance, and it has been reported to have many effects in soil to increase soil pH, uh, to increase uh, or to help with fertility, decreased disease incidence, and, um, and, and the effects of it depend on the uh, soil, uh, the feedstock, as well as um, the conditions that it's produced under. And so the goal uh, of our studies were to look at these alternative liming amendments to see what effect they would have. We started off with a set of what we called microplot studies. Basically, these were large pots um, we took two soils. We had a, a Rockford, a Lark, and Southwick soil that had a pH of 3.7 and 230 parts per million of available aluminum. And the other contrast there was a Pullman uh, Caldwell silt loam with a pH of 4.6 and about 5.6 parts per million aluminum. We had two sources of uh, fly ash. Uh, one was what we call the flower form, and the other was the, the prilled form. And what we discovered about the prilled form, and these, these uh, come out at different, uh, part, or different stages in the uh, paper production process, but the prilled form essentially is uh, not soluble. It's, a, it's like uh, little glass balls, and so uh, it had really no effect. And so we only looked at this um, in one year. We also had uh, agricultural lime, and uh, we had two sources of, of biochar, one that was wood-based and one that was, that was grass-based. And in these studies, we had what we call a factorial um, design for the treatments, which means we had biochar uh, and fly ash in all possible um, combinations. And you can see over here on the right, this table that shows um, these, these uh, treatment numbers. And the, the, here's a, a quick summary of, of what we saw in this uh, study. These uh, pots, these are about uh, uh, one and a half gallon pots. Um, we buried them in, the, uh, in a sand bed in, near our greenhouses. 
and we planted a susceptible variety in there. And what you see uh, on the left-hand side here are the treatments containing fly ash, which were the yellow circles, uh, were better than the no amendment control uh, for the Rockford soil only. And on the right-hand side, here's a treatment map that's color-coded. So if you look in this upper left-hand corner here, that's treatment one, which is no amendment uh, in the Rockford soil. And you can see there's, there's very little biomass in those pots compared with uh, the other pots that have uh, the yellow circles around them, uh, which contain fly ash and have very good biomass. Now, if you look in the Pullman soil here, this is uh, uh, the, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse or not, but uh, the pot here, uh, number 13, uh, you can see that there was not much effect of fly ash in the, in the Pullman soil. Here's a closer uh, illustration of, of that. And what, you, what we found in these uh, microplot studies was that when we added uh, fly ash in the Rockford soil, we went from a pH of 3.7 to a pH of 5.2, and aluminum uh, concentration went from 230 parts per million to 12 parts per million, and significant improvement in, in wheat stand and health. In the Palouse soil, um, we saw a similar increase in pH with addition of fly ash, uh, we saw a, a slight decrease in available aluminum and not much difference uh, in terms of the, of the plant uh, health, at least uh, visually in this study. Now, when we looked at uh, pH, uh, we have in this figure, we have pH on the left and we have aluminum concentration on the right and we have our, our code down here across the bottom, the Rockford soil on the left, the Palouse soil on the right. So FA0 is no, is a no, no amendment. Uh, FA1 is the, is the fly ash one with the two forms of biochar here. FA2 is the other form of fly ash, the, the prilled form, which I said essentially is inert. And then we had uh, ag lime over here, FAL. And what you see for pH is that uh, there's no change with pH for, with the addition of the prilled lime. With the addition of fly ash, we increased uh, pH to about 5.2 or so. Um, we increased pH to about uh, 4.3 uh, with the um, ag lime. And then this line indicates um, the aluminum concentration. And you see here, we go from that 230 parts per million down to um, uh, around 10 or so. Uh, back up with the prilled form, back down with the lime. And in the uh, Pullman soils, again, blue soils, um, there was a pH response to the fly ash, um, uh, not for the prilled form of uh, fly ash and, and similar for the, for the ag lime. And the aluminum was, was very low here. And, and as I indicated before, it, it decreased a little bit. So in these, in these microplot studies, we saw um, you know, a similar effect of fly ash as, um, as lime. And some of the differences in this study, I have to say, are, are due to um, the, the lime sources um, and, our, and uh, the lime value of the, um, of the fly ash. The lime, or excuse me, the fly ash reacted faster compared to lime. Um, and uh, it has a, a calcium carbonate equivalent similar to, to uh, lime. It also ha is more, is a, has a fineness factor that is greater than lime, which may have also helped uh, how quickly it reacted. And again, with fly ash in summary, what, when we increased application weight, we increased pH. Biochar, on the other hand, um, had no significant impact on pH in any of the soils tested. And uh, when we looked at, when we had these biochars tested for uh, calcium carbonate equivalent, it makes sense because the wood-based uh, fly ash is only 1.5% uh, calcium carbonate equivalent, and the grass-based uh, biochar had a 5.4% a calcium carbonate equivalent. So no effect of, of biochar. The, uh, the plant biomass uh, increased uh, only in the Rockford soil. And this again was where we saw pH increase from 3.7 to 5.7. Uh, we tested these, uh, we tested the varieties in the greenhouse. Uh, both wheat varieties were sensitive to low pH and, um, and the biomass changes that we observed could be due to pH, uh, aluminum and or changes in um, uh, fertility. Uh, both the lime and the fly ash 
resulted in increased uh, uh, plant biomass. There was no difference, uh, which suggests to us that fly ash could be an alternative uh, lime material. And, and again, the biochar had, had no effect. Um, one of the questions that's always asked uh, when we start using something like fly ashes is, is uh, about heavy metal accumulation and whether uh, this is going to result in, in heavy metal accumulation in the plants. Um, typically, that's more associated with fly ash from burning coal um, and not so much with organic matter. But nevertheless, uh, we had the tissues tested for cadmium, chromium, and lead and these were not detected in any of the of the plant tissue samples. So we feel confident that uh, heavy metal accumulation is, is not a concern. We next wanted to uh, move this into the field. This uh, The microplot studies were small scale, but we wanted to see if this would uh, really work in the field. And we had two locations um, in uh, near Rockford, Washington and Pullman, Washington, or Pullman, Washington location was on the Palouse Conservation Field Station. The Rockford location uh, was different from where we collected our soil previously, but it's still the uh, Rockford Larkin uh, uh, Southwick soil. Uh, a zero to three inch uh, pH of 3.7 measured in calcium chloride and uh, aluminum concentration of 230. Pullman on the other hand, Col Caldwell Silt Loam, 4.6 pH and aluminum concentration of 5.6. Um, when we looked at our rates of, of application with, uh, with the biochars, we were trying to select a rate that we thought would be uh, economically doable. And so we, we decided on a rate of 600 pounds um, uh, per acre. Uh, for the fly ash and lime, you can see our, our rates down there. In the first year in Rockford, we had um, we had overestimated uh, the lime value of the of the fly ash, and so our rate here was was lower. But these were based on on lime need tests um, that were conducted on our soil samples. So these are the rates of fly ash and lime that we applied at these locations. Um, we spread this material uh, by hand. We had basically a checkerboard design. You can see the Rockford plot here. Um, we, we spread the material by hand, and then we worked it as uh, deeply as we could with a Rotera on uh, the back of this tractor here. Uh, you can see incorporating that. In Pullman, it was a similar situation, same sort of checkerboard design, uh, applied the material uh, by hand, and then uh, worked it in uh, uh, best we could with, uh, with the Rotera. Here is a, uh, a visual representation of the response. This is uh, the 2019 to 20 uh, plot at uh, Rockford. And um, you can see here these, uh, the, the squares uh, enclosed by the black lines uh, are the replicates. And then we have the treatments uh, within each replicate. And if you look here at UTC, that stands for the untreated uh, control. And you can see the stand is, is very sparse in these uh, plots. And if you compare that with uh, the fly ash here uh, in this corner or the ag lime down here, anywhere that we had fly ash or lime, the, the stand was better um, than the untreated control. Similarly, if you look here for the biochar treatments, um, the stand is, is very comparable um, to the untreated uh, control. When we looked at uh, uh, soil pH at our zero to three inch depth, uh, and we have the uh, Pullman uh, plots across the top and the, the Rock Rockford plots across the bottom, and I know this is a lot of information here, but basically uh, where we added fly ash or ag lime, uh, we increased um, the soil pH. And this was these uh, different bars represent uh, different soil sampling times starting in October of 2019 and going through May of, of 2022. And so again, wherever we applied uh, fly ash or ag lime, we increased soil pH. Biochar by itself uh, did not have uh, a significant improvement uh, or result in a significant increase in, in soil pH. When we looked at uh, yields uh, at the uh, Rockford plot, we see here uh, on our visual stand, this is the 2019-20 trial. Uh, so this is the first year following uh, uh, application of the amendment. 
we had a visual stand rating uh, that ranged from, from one to four. And you see here, the untreated control had a rating of 1.5. Fly ash and ag lime were, were very good, three to, three to four. The biochar uh, was not much different than the untreated control. When we looked at yield uh, in that first year, um, the, the yield of the untreated control was, was only about 24 bushels per acre, and we nearly doubled that uh, with fly ash and nearly tripled it um, with the ag lime. So wherever you see an asterisk here, uh, that represents a significant uh, difference from the um, untreated um, control. So anywhere that we added fly ash or ag lime, we got a significant improvement in yield. Um, we followed this plot uh, after we harvested the winter wheat. The grower came in and planted canola. Uh, and so this would have been the second year after amendment. And uh, what, we, what we saw here was that yield of the canola about tripled uh, with, the, with the ag lime. Fly ash, uh, for some reason, was not different um, in uh, this year, at least by itself in, in this treatment. And, uh, but down here where we had fly ash with biochar, uh, there was uh, some improvement. Interestingly, we did not see, we, we repeated this uh, study in an adjacent uh, plot um, in a second year, and we did not see a response um, in the second year. And, and we're still analyzing this data and, and trying to understand why we didn't see that response. We had, uh, sorry? Hey, Tim, I have a question on that, on the, sorry to interrupt, but on the canola? Yes. Uh, was it actually 51 pounds an acre? Um, that's a good and, question. And Aaron. 158 pounds an acre? Or is that a uh, hundred weight? Or... That's a, that's a, I believe it's pounds per acre. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um. At the trial in Pullman, we had uh, a similar response. Here in Pullman, we were we actually inoculated the plot um, with uh, cephalosporium stripe. Uh, we did not get a tremendous disease response here. We did see a little some subtle differences um, in the disease response in terms of yield. We our untreated control was about eighty five bushels. And we had significant improvement in yield uh, with both fly ash and uh, ag lime uh, application, and this varied. The biochar uh, did not by itself did not have any benefit uh, on yield. Um, second year, this in this rotation, we had uh, spring wheat in the rotation. There was an improvement in yield uh, with ag lime, but not with uh, with any other treatment. And again, we saw a similar result here, and, and we're still scratching our head. In our second year uh, follow-up study, um, we did not see any responses, uh, positive responses that were um, that were significant. There were some differences in yield here, um, uh, but we had uh, enough variability that um, that these were not um, significant. So uh, the conclusion that we came to uh, that fly ash application resulted in, in soil pHs change, changes similar to ag lime. Um, wheat and canola yield improved uh, following the application of fly ash and lime, but not biochar. Uh, we had a, a positive correlation uh, between yield and uh, soil pH uh, for wheat with the greatest yield occurring at the highest uh, soil pH. And in contrast, the correlation between cephalosporin stripe uh, disease index and soil pH was negative. So as, as pH increased, disease um, decreased. And with that, I'll say the, the biggest challenge with fly ash, although it, it does serve as a, as a potential or could serve as a potential uh, liming agent, uh, application is the biggest uh, challenge right now. And that's something um, that uh, the company is looking at, whether they can develop a prilled form of the fly ash that would be easier um, to apply. And uh, with that, I want to have, I have several acknowledgements. Uh, this was a collaborative project with uh, Haiying uh, Tao, uh, Steve Van Vliet, and uh, graduate student uh, Samadhiya Jayasingh. Um, we had technical support from uh, Hong Yan Sheng and Mark Thorne, financial support 
from uh, the, the Vogel Wheat Research Fund and the CSANR uh, Bioag Research Grant. And we had in-kind support from Inland Empire Paper a Company, Columbia River Carbonates, and Ag Energy Solutions for Biochar, which is now uh, Qualterra. And I just want to acknowledge um, Steve Jones with Best Test Labs uh, is in the audience today. And Steve, uh, uh, Best Test is where we had our samples run. And Steve was a big help in terms of working with us on um, uh, the Lyme need uh, calculator. And then uh, Gudrun Mart is also, I think, in the audience with Columbia River Carbonates. And uh, they provided material uh, for this study. So with that, I want to uh, thank everyone and be happy to take questions.